Welcome back, everyone, to the Victory Podcast. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, alongside Chris Haddad, as always. And today, we have a very special guest. He is a three-year captain at Kansas State, where he also walked away with three all Big 12 nominations, was the offensive line of the year in the Big 12, and he's also a two-time All-American on the offensive line. It is none other than Dalton Reisner. Dalton, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. Now, I, I mean, you're a two-time All-American, but I mean, like, there's nine different publications. So your first team here, second team there. Like, do you pay attention to all that stuff? There's just so many accolades that get thrown at you. Yeah, man. You know, it's, it's tough. I, I'm not going to lie. I do pay attention to the All-American stuff just because that's been, a, that's been a goal of mine ever since I was a kid. And I don't, I'm not one of those guys that takes that lightly. I take a lot of a pride in that. I think it's pretty cool to be even on that list, whether it's first or second team. So I do. It's not like I, I keep a list of whether I was first or second team on which publication or whatever it was. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's something that I'm proud of. So I definitely say, oh, hey, yeah, you know, I got, you know, first team ESPN or second team from the, you know, Football Writers Association or whatever it is. So, I mean, I definitely am an honored to be on those lists. But do you have a favorite one? A favorite one? Yeah, PFF is my favorite one, man. Is it? Uh, <laughs> nice. PFF, I think that, you know, I'm not sure how all the other, you know, all Americans are decided. So I can't speak on that. All I can tell you is that PFF, an up and coming, you know, a new publication, you know, I believe that they actually are breaking down the film. They have grades on guys. I think it's funny. Um, my offensive line coach grades our games throughout the whole season. And uh, I'm one of the guys that keeps track of my grades and I average it out and say, OK, this is what I graded out on the season. And PFF was point two. Um, 0.2 points wow. away from the exact same grade that my offensive line coach gave me. And um, that's when I gained a lot of respect for them. Plus they've given me first team the last <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, that fact did not escape me. <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest. They gave me first team the last two years. So I'm a fan. <laughs> that's great that, uh, that, that kind of, uh, of course, I thought highly of them anyway, but the fact that they're that close to what your own offensive line coach says, that's, you know, pretty good that they're on the same level of someone that has no idea what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, just walk me through, though, because all, all these different accolades and stuff, what is it like, you know, here, okay, I made All-American this, but I'm going to go take my final, you know, two days later because I'm still a, a student athlete. What's yeah. it like trying to balance all that? Man, it's, it's not as hard as you would think. I can tell you that coming from Manhattan, Kansas, um, where – K-State football is everything in that town. It's a huge part of the, the town and the community. Everyone loves Kansas State football and um, loves the football players. So, I mean, I'm not going to lie. When you walk around campus, you know, everyone knows you as a football player, especially if you're a, a guy that's been a captain and been there for a while and a guy that, you know, gets, you know, this national, you know, um, recognition. So, you know, you walk around and people know you. And I'm, I'm the type of guy, man, that I, I'll take time out for anybody. I'll take time out to, to high-five a guy that's in a fraternity that thinks I'm cool or, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> say hi to someone, you know, say hi to someone in class that thinks I'm a, a cool guy or whatever it is. And, you know, I try not to let that get to my head. I know that I don't let it get to my head. And, you know, at the end of the day, fellas, you know, they're just they're just awards and recognition. You know, I'm so grateful for them. And I've worked extremely hard to get that recognition. But it doesn't make me any different as a person. You know, I'm I'm still I'm still, you know, a normal guy going to college. I just play a game of football and that game of football ends for everybody. And, I, I'm glad to say that whenever it ends for me, I'll be I'll be thankful in saying that I stuck true to who I was and and didn't let you know honors like that get to my head and make me think that you know I'm better than anyone else in any way. Yeah. yeah. Now has it has it sunk in yet that uh you know that kind of the K State days are, are over and you're transitioning to the NFL now? Has that really hit you yet, or is just kind of day by day is something new for you um, it, that it really hasn't sunk in yet? You know, our last game was November 24th, and so it's been about a month. And it, at first, I didn't, I didn't think that, you know, it was sinking in at all. But it has definitely sunk in these last two weeks just because, you know, I'm not even living in Manhattan, Kansas anymore. You know, I'm not – you know, I had to change my bios from, you know, uh, football at Kansas State University to former football player at Kansas State <laughs> University. And it's just uh, it's just a weird feeling, man. I, I grew into who I was in those five years. And I'm so I'm so grateful for my five years at Kansas State and the coaches and the community and the football, the blood, sweat and tears in that town. And, 
um, it's definitely tough. And I can definitely tell you it's sunken in, but it's hard uh, to be down whenever, you know, I have so much to look forward to in my future. So I'm, I'm definitely upset that I'm leaving there, but you know, I'm a 23 year old. There's guys in the NFL that are, that are 21. So, you know, I got to leave college at some point, even though I, was, <laughs> I, I had to leave, man. <laughs> Um, well, you know, just speaking of, uh, you know, your time at K-State, uh, of course, you know, it, it's a huge part of who you are. But I wanted to ask you just kind of to set the stage before you even got there. You know, back in high school, you were a, a big football recruit coming out of Colorado, even though it was a small town, but you were a center. Uh, you were also really good at shot put and you played a little bit of basketball. So you kind of had a multi-sport athlete thing going on. So can you just talk us about, you know, how exactly you were able to use that background of doing a couple different things, you know, to be a center, but then you ultimately move out to tackle. Just can you talk about athleticism and different disciplines and, you know, maybe how that's helped you? Yeah. Yeah, man. I love the, I love the story of where I come from and the sports I played in high school. It was a town of 800 people, 28, in my graduating class. And, and I tell you, I played all the sports cause I had to, if I did it, they probably wouldn't have been able to have a, t have a team. That's how it was. You know, we have, you know, 15, 16 guys that if we don't all go out for baseball and track and wrestling and basketball and football, we're not going to have a team. So, you know, that's a big reason why I did that. But um, just a quick note, a side note, you mentioned basketball. I have to let you know before I get in on your question, I, I do hold the record in Wiggins, Colorado for most rebounds per game. So I'm very, <laughs> I'm very passionate. About what was that, that number? 23 rebounds per 20, game. Ooh. Right here. Wow. <laughs> that was my average. I'm not going to say I was going against guys my same height, but it was, it was really cool. <laughs> um, but you know, playing those three sports, man, you know, I was always center. I was center ever since I was um, six or seven years old. I played center my whole life. Senior year, I played left tackle for three games, um, kind of got used to it. But the game of basketball and the footwork that it entails and the conditioning and running up and down the court and playing defense and being in an athletic position, uh, I feel I believe that basketball helped me a ton. I played basketball ever since I was a kid. And in terms of footwork and being able to be quick and agile, it helped me a ton. And then whenever you're throwing shot put and discus, a lot of people think that it's all muscle. But I can promise you, you know, I didn't win state my senior year. And the guy that won state was five inches shorter than me and probably 150 pounds less than me. And he just had perfect technique. So shot put and discus requires a lot of patience and a lot of perfect technique, just like the game of football, just like playing tackle and center does and guard mm -hmm. and offensive line. People might think that all you need is strength and all you need is to be a big bruiser, but I can promise you that's not what you all, that's not only what you need. You got to have technique and you got to be able to be patient and perfect your craft. So, but no, to play all those sports and get up to Kansas state and make the transition to right tackle, you know, it wasn't as hard as what wasn't as hard as I thought, you know, as center, I'd always watch tackles and be like, man, I don't even know what a kick slide is. I'm used to just shuffling back and, and punching right away. Yeah. Dealing with these 400 pounders. I don't even want to know what a kick slide's like. I can't block those guys. And um, now I'm a tackle looking at center saying, I don't want to block those big boys no more. I'm cool, <laughs> with, I'm cool with blocking these DNs. So, you know, it was, it was a big transition to tackle. But, you know, like you mentioned, man, you know, playing basketball and, and doing track and playing baseball in high school and, and all those deals, I feel like helped me, you know, helped me mold into the, the tackle that I became in terms of being athletic and agile and all that. Yeah, you know, we had John Jansen on. He mentioned the same thing. It's how being a multi-sport athlete not only helps you function better, but it teaches you how to win and lose um, yeah. because it puts yourself in a, a competitive environment. I mean, you mentioned all those sports that you had to go play. Your your team doesn't doesn't you know feel the team. Um, yeah. You know, you may think like, oh, another sport, another sport, as a kid at least, but the kids don't realize that they're being put in these environments that, hey, you got to win, you know, yep. <laughs> figure it out how to win. And in close games, those players get it done and, uh, and other times they don't. Yeah, um, exactly. But I want to transition here. I have a note here that your father was your high school coach, yeah? Yep. And, uh, what was that like playing for him? Man, everyone might think that whenever you play for your father, it might be this, you know, glorious um, experience and it's <laughs> – Dad hugging after the game and you know easy on you in practice you get everything I can tell you that it was the exact opposite you know my dad um, started my dad started the peewee program in in my hometown whenever I was five for me and my brothers and coached me and my three older brothers and probably my younger brother too all the way through peewees whenever we got to middle school he became the middle school coach and coached us in seventh and eighth grade and then Whenever my older brothers got to high school, he petitioned to be the high school head football coach, and he got that. And he coached by um, – he's, he's going on um, five – he has five boys, and he's coaching the last one 
in his uh, senior year of high school this next year. So he uh-huh. coached all of us, like, literally throughout high school, which was awesome. But uh, there was a lot of grabbing face masks, a lot of crying, and a lot of uh, issues. <laughs> tough at, love. At football, man. Tough he, love, yeah. Tough love. Yeah, tough he, love. He, he expected a lot out of us. He expected a lot out of me. I've always been kind of a guy that likes to step into the leadership position, and he demanded that from me. And he, he let you know when you weren't doing it right, and he lets you know whenever you were being, you know, a baby and you were being soft and you weren't being a football player. And he, you know, he pushed me and made me uncomfortable every single time he was on the field, and I'm so grateful for him for that. Mm. You know, I, I don't believe that I would be able to be the player I was today if it wasn't for him driving me every single day. He never let me get complacent. You know, I was always a big dude, 1A football Guys weren't that big. I was, I, you know, I would dominate some guys and, and he would never let me get complacent in terms of thinking that I had made it or that I was good enough. He mm-hmm. always was correcting me. And, you know, I'm, I, I love my memories with him. He, he did a really good job, what I can speak on, of being a coach and a dad. He was a coach on the football field. Say I had the worst practice in the world and me and him got at it. You know, I'm a young kid. You know, I'm immature. I'm in high school. Uh, I'd hold a grudge. We'd get off the field and I'd be like, you know, you know, screw you, dad. You know, you just ripped me all day, yeah. you know, in front of my friends. And, you know, you're way harder on me than them. You know, what? what's up? And then he would be a dad as soon as the, he got off the football field. He wouldn't want to, you know, if I wanted to talk football, he would. But then he'd be there for me, ask me about school, let me know if I needed anything. You know what I mean? He did a yeah. really good yeah. job of, of having that separation between the dad and the coach. And I didn't do a good job of that because I was young and immature and I would just hold the grudge, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. That, that's just adolescence though, man. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, after your time in high school, of course you go to Kansas state, you spend five years there, but I really wanted to know what was that road like going from small town, you know, just how did, how did they even enter the picture? You know, what did that path look like for you? Man, it was a, a very unique path. I was the I was the first one from my school to ever go play Division One football. So that I was the first athlete to be able to do that from my hometown. And I can promise you it wasn't easy, man. Starting in eighth grade, you know, me and my dad caught on real quick that, that no teams were ever going to come through Wiggins, Colorado to see the talent that we had. You know, they were going through Valor Christian to check out Christian McCaffrey, which I'm sure you guys are aware of. Mm-hmm. And you know, check out guys like that because they've had guys come out of those schools. No one's going to come down to Wiggins and check us out. So we said, okay, we got to start going to camp. So starting my eighth grade summer, we'd go to probably 15 or 20 camps every single year. You know, my friends are at the lake. My friends are hanging out, having a great time, wanting to know where I'm at. And I'm on the road with my dad and mom, you know, going to Colorado, Colorado State, Northern Colorado, um, New Mexico, Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas State, Iowa State, you know, a big Midwest tour of all these schools um, trying to get exposure from coaches and learn, you know, frankly, from a 1A school, you're not going to know that you're not going to have a guy that played in the NFL coaching you. You're not going to have a guy that, you know, played division one football coaching you shoot, man. You know, it's just, it's just a bunch of, you know, small town guys playing the game of football. You know, it's like, Hey, block this guy, block that guy. It's not, it's not, Hey, take a subtle step. I can promise you it's not that. So, um, Working through all through high school, I go to 15, 20 camps a year. Obviously, I started getting better and better when it got to my junior year. I remember this moment forever. I was up at, with a, a Wyoming camp with a guy named Pete Caligas. He was an offensive line coach, and he looked at me. And this was my sophomore summer going into junior year. And he said, you're going to, he said, you're going to play division one football. And I, I remember that for the rest of my life. It was the coolest feeling in the world because up to three years before that, I had heard from various coaches like, you know, I always ask them, you know, like, is this something I should pursue? And they're like, I think a lower level. And whenever he told me that, I was like, man, I can play. You know, I'm a 1A guy, but I can play this game. I know I can. I've always been a confident guy. My father's always believed in me. So ended up getting a lot of offers. Uh, I got Colorado State, Northern Colorado, and Wyoming. And I, I only had those three offers for a couple months. So me and my dad were like, okay, we think we're going to go to Wyoming. That's just where we're going to be. We wanted to get some bigger offers, but that's just how it ended up. I was a big dude. So I was about to be done with my junior year. There's a lot of junior days going on, which was a big thing. I don't know if that still is, but it's like a, almost like an official visit for juniors in high school. Yep. And as soon as Kansas state offered, Mizzou offered Arizona state and all the offers started rolling in. And it was really, really cool, man. I, I remember the day, I got a message from a Mizzou football coach and he said, we, we want you to be in the black and gold. And I, I remember telling my dad and he just started bawling. I, I never see my dad cry, but he just started bawling, man. He, he, he 
wanted to play football growing up. He always wanted to play Division One football, and then he was just balling, sitting at his desk. And uh, some of the I could talk, I could talk for hours, fellas. But the experience was unreal because yeah. you know, that's I a special told, moment. Yeah, yeah, I was told, absolutely. Yeah, I was told so many times that I wouldn't be, be able to do it, and I was told mm-hmm. so many times that you know I shouldn't pursue it. But I kept working at it, and then once all those offers came in, it was uh, an awesome experience. But when I got to Kansas State a wake-up call to say the least man Mm -hmm. a wake-up call i had no technique i i'd always been bigger than guys and never had to use technique right i'd latch onto a guy and drive him to the fence and like i mentioned earlier i don't i didn't know what a settle step was i didn't know what a reach block was you know and i can promise you that two weeks in i wanted to quit kansas state is not a program that's easy kansas state is a program that's run off of hard work and discipline and coach Snyder demands that out of us. And I called my dad. I said, dad, I'm done. Like, this isn't for me, you know, dad, these guys are big and strong and fast. They know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I said, dad, no one knows me, you know, and, and, and sure enough, he drove up seven hours. We talked for three hours. He reminded me of why I was doing it and reminded me of, of how hard we had worked the last four years to get there and I still thank him and my mom because she came up too. I still thank him and my mom to this day. I'm just like, thank you guys so much for not letting me give up on this dream. And it was a, a whirlwind from there. And, you know, I continued to grow and work hard and I learned more and I got bigger and stronger. And, you know, a year from the day I wanted to quit, a year later, I was getting ready to start my first Division One uh, football game yeah. as a redshirt freshman. Yeah. And uh, it was a blessing, man. It's crazy how it all happens, right? Because yeah. you put a, an 18-year-old kid in a foreign city with a bunch yeah. of people he doesn't know, with a bunch of coaches screaming at him. It, yep. You know, it's, it's tough for an 18-year-old kid, but it molds you fast, right? And you grow up real yeah. fast, too. And, uh, you know, from that moment, I'm sure you were like, all right, you know, you wanted to quit. You get that that uh you know speech from your father your mother you're like all right let's i you know you know you can do it you just need that yeah. influence to help you do it yeah. uh, but i'm sure bill snyder helped you do it as well right what was it like playing for him uh you know ultimately the end of your career um you know he was there and, and he did what he did you know how was it playing uh under bill it was a it was a honestly an amazing experience to yeah. play for a hall of fame coach like that you know he made a promise to me in my official visit one of the main reasons i came to kansas state was because he talked about the, the better he was going to make me a better husband a better father a better son a better friend you know to the people around me and i, I thought that was so special because he he had play, played this game and coached this game for so long he realized that there was more life than football, that we all love this game of football. But he, he knew that someday football would end for me, but his job was to make me a better man and be prepared for when football was over. And I'm like, I like that. I like a guy that realizes that, you know, this game's going to be over, but who, who am I going to be when it's over? And he realized that. And throughout my five years, the discipline that he, you know, you know, enforced and had us all follow and the, the type of hard work he made us put in and how much he got out of us and he got the best out of each and every one of us and he demanded that. I just, I respected that so much because I feel like a lot of football players nowadays, you know, might might get a little bit more than they deserve and might, you know, be entitled to some things or at least believe that they're entitled to, to some things that I don't think that necessarily are. And whenever that game of football is taken away from them, you see a lot of guys struggle. You see a lot of guys struggle yeah. with their identity. You see a lot of guys struggle with who am I, right? I don't have this game of football. I've always been this big football player that's all American and everyone loves me and wants my autograph and wants pictures. But now I tore my knee and I don't play football anymore and no one knows me and I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad for those guys because they didn't have a coach like Coach Snyder who said, I know who you are outside of football. I'm going to help. I'm going to help you find out. And that's why I'm so grateful for him is because if I were to, you know, knock on wood, if I were to, you know, get injured, never be able to play this game again, never be able to play at the NFL level, that would be a bummer. But at the same time, I'm so confident in who I am and my vision for what I want to do in life that that I'm confident with that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not being the guy that people want pictures with and people, mm-hmm. you know, cause that's what yeah. it is right now. That's what yeah. it is right now. People think that, you know, you're a great football player and they want to be with you, but um, that's why I'm so thankful for coach Snyder. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and you know, what's funny is just that uh, of course, from your perspective, you know, if it were to end now, it would be really difficult because you've had, you know, you've done so well playing yeah. college, but you know, I didn't play after high school and it was weird for me to not play because I had always associated myself with playing it and loving the sport. And it was like, well, now it's over. So now yeah. who am I? Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, guys, after they retire in the NFL, it's like, Oh, well, what's next? Yep. Who, who am I? 
So the yep. fact that you've, you've already developed that train of thought is, it's only going to pay you dividends in the future. But um, I, I don't think that you necessarily needed Coach Snyder to put that in your head. It, it seems from everything that I've read and seen about you that that's kind of been the person that you are. I, I mean, well, I, I want to get into this later, but now it just seems like a good time. It, at such a young age, you already have a foundation set up. So do you want to just talk now a little bit about the Reisner Up Foundation? Yeah, man, I'd love to. You know, first off, I appreciate that. And um, a big a big thing of mine has always been I love to talk. I love to speak, right? So I, I'd speak at pep rallies here in Manhattan, Kansas, and I would speak at, you know, on behalf of the team. And everyone would always be like, Dalton, you know, we, we want to hear more from you. It's so funny. We, we spoke after the Texas Bowl my sophomore year. So I'm like a sophomore in college. And there's a guy at the basketball game that's always hyping up fans at high, halftime. That's his job. And, I, you know, the football team had this halftime deal. So he introduces us and says, you guys are going to hear from your uh, 2017 or whatever um, football captain. And I get up there and I had all the, you know, fans going crazy. I was, you know, yelling things. And, and everyone was tweeting at, out at me after saying, like, you know, who needs the other guy? We need Dalton Reisner or something. He was, it was, I just thought it was hilarious. And kind of from then on, I kind of saw that I was able to have an impact on people with the things that I said and with my voice, especially since I'm a football player. And I kind of, as I grew in my faith and as I grew in college, I said, you know, kind of like I was talking about, there's more to this game than just football. I believe that, you know, I'm six foot five, 300 pounds, and there's a lot of guys that wish they could be six foot five. And, you know, I can promise you guys one thing, and I mean this. There's guys out there that will work just as hard as me. I'm not a guy that says no one will work as hard. I, I promise you I'll work hard, but I can promise you there's a five foot ten kid that, that would have worked just as hard as me if he would have had my height and he could have played Division One football too. And, the, and why I say that is because I look at that and say, well, I, I was given this height and weight for a reason. You know, I believe that God gave me this platform to not just play the game of football and be some arrogant person that puts his head above other, everyone else's, but instead to – utilize my platform with all these kids and people looking up to me because of the game I play to impact others. And that's when the whole Rise Up Foundation came to play. I said, you know, hey, everyone loves to hear from me. People love when I talk. I feel like I have an impact on them when I do so. And, you know, I want to do something more outside this game. I want to create a foundation. I want to be able to give back to others. I love watching people smile. I love I love seeing myself have an impact on others. So, um, it started off, it was crazy. It wasn't going to be a foundation. All I was going to do was go live on Facebook once a week to update people back in Wiggins, Colorado, and my community in Manhattan, Kansas, on what I was up to and what was going on. So I did that. And people were getting on with their kids from Wiggins. People were, you know, kids were asking me questions. And I'd be on there for two hours. And i do it once a week. And people are like, Dalton, um, cause you could save that video and people could watch it. So I'd get all these comments and say, Dalton, we want to hear, uh, motivation from you. We heard you talk a little bit about it, but we want you to make motivational videos. So then I'm like, okay, so I'm going to do this live. I'm going to do this live video once a week, but now I'm going to make a motivational video. So then I started making motivational videos and talking about faith or talking about my journey in football or talking about hard work or family or whatever it was. And people are like, Oh my gosh, like we really love this. So why are you doing all these videos? What's your plan? And I was just like, well, I was just going to do videos. I didn't know that this was, I didn't know that I had to have a plan. Yeah. And then I was like, but I could see this going somewhere. And, and that's when I said, okay, I want to create this into a foundation. I want to make this something people, something that people can subscribe to and follow and say, what's going on with the Riser Up Foundation. So that's what I did. I created a foundation and that foundation is based solely and primarily on one thing. And that one thing, the whole purpose of the foundation is to be a positive light in, in people's lives around you and make an impact on those people, whether that's through faith. I believe that every, you know, not everyone has faith. Not everyone believes in God, and that's fine. I just want to be able to impact people in a positive way, whether that's through faith, football, family, whatever it is. I want the Rise of Rep Foundation to be something that encourages others in a day and age that necessarily, to be honest with you guys, I don't think the popular thing nowadays is to, is to be a good person. I, the, the popular thing isn't to hold the door or to be kind to someone and take time out for others. Unfortunately, I think that sometimes – 
the popular thing is to take care of yourself and do what's best for yourself. And I'm obviously don't think that that's what's right. I think that we need to take time out for others. And, and I believe that's why we're down here. So that's how the whole foundation got started. I have big plans for it. It's definitely like literally on the ground right now. It hasn't even began to, you know, get up and going. We're getting a website going. I just got my logo trademarked and everything like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of big plans for the Rise of the Foundation. That's awesome, man. It, and as, yeah, right. as it grows it, it, and you grow, you know, of course, because you're going to be drafted, you'll be in a new city. And then I'm sure that team's going to help you grow with it as well. I mean, we are more than willing to do whatever we can to help, you know, promote it on the website whenever initiatives come up. Because it's such a cool thing that you're doing and you already have it together. The whole thing, uh, I'm sure, is going to take off very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can't be happier for it because your message and just trying to do the right thing, be a good person. Mm -hmm. It's sorely needed and, and people are going to love it. And not just the people that you know back home, You're, whatever you, the, the new place that you call home is, I guarantee you that it's going to work there because it doesn't matter where you are. That's a message people can get behind. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I, I did want to just transition a little bit off of that though. Um, we know right now you're on the West Coast. You're getting ready, working out. Can you just tell us between now and draft day well, what's on the schedule between the combine, the Senior Bowl, and just you know how you're trying to prepare for everything? Yeah. So I, I just signed with my agent about two weeks ago. I signed my SRA. I'm locked in with them. A great group of guys. Mark and yep, I can yeah. verify for Andy Cabot as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andy, Mark, you know, yeah. Shannon Polk, you know, a great group of guys. So that's a big step for a lot of guys. You know, a lot of guys are still in bowl games or in the playoffs, so they haven't signed with their agent. But that's something I was able to do early. So I signed with them. Um, I figured out where I was going to go train, which is out here in Anaheim, California, um, at a place called Stars um, here in SoCal. A great group of guys, guys that, you know, are going to get me better. Uh, um, NFL player uh, has a son that's playing in the NFL named Pat Harlow. He's going to be training me out here. He's a head coach at J. Sarah High School. So a lot of good people in my corner and a lot of people that I'm working with out here in California. Um, get ready for the Senior Bowl. I have the Reese's Senior Bowl on January 26th. I accepted my invite for that. That's going to be a big deal for me. Um, I believe that I'm a guy that with these next few months, you know, wherever I'm at in the draft right now, I couldn't tell you guys, but I believe that, you know, with things like the combine and the senior bowl, that could really raise my draft stock because at the senior bowl, I believe I'll probably be playing center guard and tackle probably on both sides of the ball, like right and left side. Um, that's going to be huge for me. That's either going to be really good or really bad, but I promise you it's going to be really good because, you know, you're going against good competition and they want to see how you do. They want to see how you perform. And uh, that's why I accepted the invite because I think that could be really beneficial. And so as after the senior bowl is over, um, as long as I get the combine invite, I'll be going to the combine and doing all those drills and the bench press and trying to get exposure that way in terms of the interviews. And then after the combine, I'll head down to Kansas State and do my pro day. And just based off my combine results, I don't know how much I'll be doing at pro day, but that'll also be a big step for me. And then as soon as pro day's over, I'll be living in Manhattan for the month of April. And that's when teams visit you or you visit teams and they're doing physicals and they're doing checkups or you're going out to lunch or you're shaking hands with a general manager. You know, I'm not sure, so sure what that'll entail in terms of if I'll be flying out or if they'll be flying in, but that's an experience that I'm excited for. And then at the end of April, the, the draft comes and, you know, man, whether it's first round, seventh round or undrafted, you know, if teams, if, if one team gives me a chance to put on a helmet, that's all I need. You know, I, I sure hope it's first round. And, but if it's undrafted, uh, bet that sounds good to me. You know, there's a lot of kids that would have killed just to play college football. So if I even get the chance to play NFL ball, which I hope I do, you know, you know, I'm excited for that opportunity. It'll be very fun. Well, you know, if nothing else, I, I hope that this podcast at least let you out, uh, you know, flex those muscles for uh, those vocal pipes there. You know, get, get, get you ready to talk a little bit in front of some people. Yeah, that's sorry. awesome, man. That's ex it's exciting, too. It's like every every day you wake up, something new, you know, or every I shouldn't say every day, but every month. It's like, you know, you're going to be in a new city. You're going to be training for something new. I mean, that this is a, like, you know, you're just doing work, playing football. And now it's all of a sudden, you know, it's. You've, you're already kind now. of a professional athlete now. That's what I mean. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Yeah. It's a process I've looked looked forward to for a while, and 
you know, a lot of kids, I don't know if they do, I can't speak on behalf, but for me, I just don't take it for granted. Like the fact that I get to play in the Reese's senior bowl, a bowl game I've watched for 10 years, probably, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a dream come true, man. That's, that's the best of the best in college football. And then to go to the NFL combine and, you know, put on that shirt and run that 40, you know, that everyone watches the combine, like that's a dream come true. So knowing that those things are coming up in my future, you know, are fueling me and, and definitely helping me realize, you know, how lucky and blessed I am. So you, you kind of hit on this a little bit. Do you pay attention to the mock drafts at all and see like, oh man, who does, does this person say I'm like first round or second round? Um, a little bit. I used to pay attention a lot more to them, especially last year. But after I've seen guys like Cody White here, who is a guy that he's a, he's a senior at Kansas State when I was a freshman, left tackle, got drafted in the second round with the Chicago Bears. He's the starting center there, all rookie team. He's been really, really successful. Yeah. Cody wasn't on any mock draft. Like I'm telling you, I'm telling you, was not on the top three rounds or four rounds for any mock draft out there. And I was so big into that my freshman, sophomore year. I was like, man, the mock drafts, you know, where are these guys going? And no uh, – no, you know, harm to those mock drafts, the people that put them out, but they're so inaccurate sometimes. I've seen guys that, you know, are, you know, predicted in the first round that will go in the fifth or sixth round or guys that weren't on any mock drafts like Cody, and then he goes in the second round. And it just proves that there's so much more to the process than just the public, than the public eye and what the public views you at, views you and like where you're at in the season and things like that. A lot of it depends on your interviews at the combine and the relationships you make and, and, you know, the different types of forties and your jumps and all that kind of stuff that goes into it. So I used to look into it a lot this year. I couldn't tell you, like, I, I don't know if I've like looked at, I think Mel Kuyper has one or all that stuff, but I haven't, I haven't looked. I couldn't tell you guys, honestly, look in your eye. I couldn't tell you if I'm on there as a first rounder or a seventh rounder. I have no idea. So tailoring off of that question that Steve asked, do you pay attention to, and it could be in the same bubble too, do you pay attention to any of the negative criticism that comes out? You know, yeah, uh, you see yeah. all the time, you know, with all, uh, especially linemen, it's like, oh, he's got, you know, slow feet or, you know, doesn't have heavy hands or, uh, you know, all that criticism that comes out. Because I know, you know, you probably know what you need to work on. Your trainers need to know what you need to work on. Uh, do you pay attention to any of that stuff that people on TV are talking about what you need to work on? You know, I pay attention to all of it, good and bad, positive and negative. I can tell you that the positive feels good, right? Mm -hmm. Because people notice you and they notice your hard work and you're like, man, to be able to get that recognition, I really appreciate that. But I don't let that positive enforcement change the way I work or let it get to my head in any way, Mm -hmm. just like the negative. I see it all. People, I think it's funny because people think that you don't see it, right? But we see it. Like, we see it, definitely. And. I don't mind it. I see it and it doesn't, it doesn't infuriate me. It doesn't make me mad. Sometimes I laugh at whoever said it and I, you know, I might want to send a, a, a smart response <laughs> back, but um, it, it, just like the negative, it doesn't change the way I play. It's not going to, I'm not going to let someone else fuel me with them talking bad about my game. And, mm-hmm. you know, you see both the good and the bad and, you know, everyone sees it. So I definitely, I'll definitely say that I definitely see it, but I'd like to think that I don't let it affect me in terms of how I play or how I hold myself in anyway. Yeah, and that's good because if someone says you don't have heavy hands, I mean, you're still going to punch someone in the chest when yeah. you did a yeah. big on big block or something, you know? So I, yeah. I agree with that. And yep. sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, they might say something and it might get me to think and be like, oh, man, this guy might have, a, you know, I'm not one to think that I'm this great football player that has no room to grow. You know, as an mm-hmm. offensive lineman, I have never had a game that I'm content with. Honestly, very few plays that I'm content with. Even if I bury a guy in the ground, I'm like, man, I wish I would have had my right hand inside or I wish I would have, you know, had a better first step, whatever it is. So, you know, a lot of it, sometimes I take with a grain of salt and I say, hey, you know, that guy kind of has a point, man. He talked about my bad hands. Well, shoot, watch that play. My hands were pretty bad. You yeah. know what I mean? So mm-hmm. uh, some some of it I actually take and, and, you know, say, oh, hey, they might have a point there. Yeah. So I want to – this is the last question I have here. Um, what advice would you give to – a younger athlete that is that wants to be in your shoes, right? That wants to be the next Dalton riser and wants to be the next great offensive lineman out there. And what advice would you give to him? You know, man, I look, I look him in the eye and say, believe in yourself and, mm-hmm. and believe in yourself. That's one of the most important things in the world. Cause there's going to be so many people that, yeah, you, you guys want to believe how many people have told me, you know, you're not, you're not going to make it, you know what I mean? You're not going to make it play division one ball. And if you make it there, you're not even going to start. Or, you know, when I showed up to Kansas state, you know, people tell me like, yeah, well, you're probably not going to play. You know, I've heard it all, but throughout it all, I believed in myself and I remembered why I was doing it. So that'd be my biggest thing to, to a young guy saying, 
have a reason as to why you're playing and why you want to be great. Because if you don't have a reason why you want to be great, then why do you want to be great? Right. Mm -hmm. If we want to be great, you've got to have a reason. And everyone has a different reason as to why they want to be. So I'd say have a reason as to why and believe in yourself throughout the whole process. You know, it's, it, it's too much to take in to try to, you know, go from being a high school athlete to say, I want to be an all American. You got to take it as baby steps. You know, yeah. I set I set little, I set little goals and I continue to right now, you know, I want to be in the, I want to, yeah, sure. I want to be in the, I want to put on a gold jacket someday in the NFL, mm -hmm. but that's not my goal right now. If it was, I wouldn't ever make it because I'm going to forget about all the other stuff that's important. Yeah. So, you know, right now my goal is, is to train extremely hard and get myself healthy for senior bowl. And then once I'm to senior bowl, it's, it's to play well and to have a good week at senior bowl. And then it's preparing for combine. It's all these little goals. So on top of, you know, what I said earlier, I would say, you know, having little goals for everything you do. So if it's a young guy that's in high school, you know, don't be looking to college. If you have a year left in high school, whether you have offers or not, focus on being a great leader for your team and focus on being a, a good football player. And how can you get better for your senior year? And then once you graduate, then start looking to college and, and, and so on. That's great advice. Yep. It's awesome. Yeah. No, Dalton, before we wrap up, we have this last little segment that we call the gauntlet. I have a couple quick questions for you when I need your answer. All right. What is most important, the number one offense or the number one defense? Offense. <laughs> All right. Now, did you have a certain pregame ritual that you stuck to? Yep. Can you tell us what we it is? Here. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Give us oh. all the details. <laughs> I would run around the uh, – I'd go out for warm-ups. I'd catch with my roommate of five years, best friend. We'd throw around the ball. We'd run around the field, um, touch every pylon in every corner, and then dap each other up. And he would go go and do running uh, more drills, and I'd run back in the uh, locker room. I did that for four years in a row, every single game. He transferred this last year, and it was not – It no. was not oh, – It was. Geez. I was so nervous for this first game because I'm like, bro, I didn't have anyone to do the ritual with. I can't do it with anyone else. Um, you know, I let it get to my head, but it wasn't a big deal. But I had that ritual for four years and did it every single game, and then unfortunately this year I uh, didn't have the opportunity to do it again. Oh, man. Well, you know what? That's an opportunity to start a new ritual, which uh, yeah. you know, hopefully we'll get to hear about it next year after your rookie season. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, to this point, do you have a favorite football memory? Oh, yeah. My favorite, Come on, man. Tell us. My favorite football memory is um, senior night of this season. Last game I'll ever play at Kansas State University uh, with a purple jersey on. Um, I scored a touchdown. Um, I was a, uh, it was against Texas tech and, you know, it was a play we worked on all year. It was a, I'd kick twice, you know, roll back. My quarterback would throw it back to me at, and I'd, I'd score and, and I caught it. And as I was running into the end zone, I stiff armed a guy. It was one of the coolest, <laughs> coolest memories in my entire life to honestly, probably one of the last plays of the game too. So like, it just was, everything was paid off. You know, the whole, the whole fans were going crazy. My whole sideline, you know, was running over to me just because, you know, I'm a guy that's been there for five years. They all know me and I hope love me. And um, it was just a it was just a crazy experience, man, for a big guy first, you know, to score a touchdown and then to do it on senior night. The last time I'll ever play on that field, it was a very emotional night, man. All right. Now, of course, whenever you do sign with the team, there's going to be a signing bonus. Do you have any thoughts for what that first purchase is going to be? Man, I do. I've already thought about it a ton, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, pay <laughs> off, I'm gonna pay off mom and dad's debt, man. That's my, that's my cool. first. Cool. That's first so purchase. cool. Yeah. And then number two, right in line, is I want to pay off the, the 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 three brothers right now. I'll pay off their college, man. I just think that'd be pretty. I think that'd be pretty special. That's awesome, man. That's that, that's, yeah. that's so true to uh, the, you know the character that you kind of shown throughout. So that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So thank and this you. is the last one. I promise. What's most important, the players or the scheme? The players of the scheme. Oh, the players, a hundred percent every time, hundred percent, hundred percent. Big believer in that. Big believer in that. I'm a big believer in a coach can run whatever he wants. He can be successful or not successful, but it's all about what. What are you going to do as a player? You could get the worst play call, but run it perfectly, and it would still be successful. That's awesome, man. Good point, Dalton. 
Thank you so much for coming on with us. We know that you're going to have a huge impact on the field next year, but we know you're going to have just as big an impact off the field. We're looking forward to following your story. We'll be watching on draft day for you to see where you go. Hopefully we'll be one of the first to give you a congratulations, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we'd love to have you on in the future. Talk more about the foundation and, and just how that the whole transition is going to go for you, but we wish you the absolute best. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It was a, it was a pleasure to be on here talking to you all. Right. And just to wrap up again for everyone, that's the Reisner Up Foundation right now. They're on Facebook, soon to have the website up. And also, you're on all the social media platforms, but we want everyone to check you out on Twitter at DaltonBigD71. Sure. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, all right. Awesome.